Welcome to Crazy Shit in Real Estate, a weekly podcast where I walk you through some of the wildest, most unbelievable stories you'll hear from the world of real estate. If you like real estate and you love crazy, this is the podcast for you. Okay, so Tracy, when you're doing real estate in one of the biggest city areas in the world that's known for its high level of cost and people have their own particular mindsets and perceptions and assumptions when they come see you about real estate. I know you get to see some really interesting things. So if I'm your new buyer client and now I have signed an agency agreement which marries us together, so now I can't get rid of you, you can't get rid of me, and you now have permission to tell me all the good stories, what are you gonna tell me as your buyer that's the thing you didn't expect that you saw in doing professional real estate? Uh, Well, I just have to make the caveat, we don't have buyer agency agreements here. So I have to make them love me a lot. Are you for real? Y'all don't have agency agreements in New Jersey? I've been doing this for 10 years. The only person I ever got to sign a buyer agency agreement without batting an eye was somebody coming from California and they sign them there all the time. So I'm told. So they had no problem with it. But if I want to earn my two and a half percent, I have to go on faith. Okay, so carry on now that we're thinking about that. By the way, if you are a normal consumer listening to this, agency is when we have that conversation with you that says, I'm your realtor, and if you buy something, I'm going to get paid. And if you don't use me, then you're going to have to pay me if you sign this piece of paper. And it's good because it lets us be your fiduciary. But it's also bad because sometimes if you are the person out there who signed paperwork with the wrong individual, you can feel a little bit like you're in a very unhealthy hostage situation. So that being said, carry on, Tracy. Some of the things I have to educate my clients on are the age of our homes. Our homes are 1920s. You know, that's probably the newest house you're going to find, maybe a 1940 or a 1950. And they're used. They are used. They are not perfect. They're not new construction. You are basically living in this house for however many years you have your mortgage or how long you stay. And then it goes on to the next person and it has bumps and bruises and the paint's going to chip and tiles are going to crack, but you're buying a house as is. And this comes up all the time. Well, what does that mean as is? I'm like, that means what you see is what you get. If there's major structural, mechanical, electrical, environmental, or pest issues, we can ask the seller to cure or give a credit. Beyond that, it's your house and you're buying it the way you see it. And that is very difficult, especially for first time home buyers to wrap their heads around. Well, and add into that, that we're moving further and further away from the, I can do it mentality where people just don't know how to change a light bulb and change the weather stripping and do their own tile work and do even minor house repairs themselves. And you start to understand that's kind of why these millennials and first timers freak out because their dads knew how to get under the hood and fix it, but they sure don't. Absolutely. Um, I am a proud Gen Xer. I don't need anybody to tell me what generation I am and talk about me. (laughs) I'm happy to be me. And my husband and I moved out here and we just wanted a house that nobody had screwed up. We didn't care what the kitchen looked like. We didn't care what paint color it was. We bought a house specifically because the previous owner lived here for like 30 years. He, they were adorable. They, um, you know, they're the ones who service the furnace every year. They're the ones who even in the garage, they marked every year where they changed the oil in their old Chevelle or whatever the car was. That's what we were looking for. I completely agree with you. Now people want move in ready. They, and there, I mean, there's more to it in the sense that Chances are it's a dual income, one or two kids. They're supporting the nanny. They're going into the city every day. They don't have the time to change a light bulb. They really don't. So I can appreciate that pain point, and um, I try and help them as much as I can. I'm not a contractor. I'm not an inspector. But I can point out what asbestos is. I can point out what knob and tube wiring is. I can tell them when I see a house that feels really good. They're going to have an inspector go through and point out all the crazy things that have happened to the house. But I try to give them a comfort level of this is a horrible flip and don't go near it or this house has been taken care of really, really well. My mind totally got hung on what you and your husband fell in love with with your house because, you know, I'm a realtor and I get distracted. And I love that what y'all fell in love with was the 
meticulous record keeping of HVAC service and oil changes, not even so much oil changes as the HVAC service. So I'm curious about something, since y'all have lived in this house for some time now and you've been a realtor for some time, do you tell your buyers, hey, I fell in love with my house because we could tell that they took care of it. So maybe y'all had ought to keep a little checklist of all the times you've had the HVAC service so the buyer can see it when they look at the unit because frankly, I'm fixing to go tell all of my clients they should be keeping that record right by the unit instead of in their Evernote files where they keep it now because what a nice way to show your peace of mind. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tell them to do the taking care of while they're living in the house, but most of them don't do the record keeping either on the wall, next to the machine, in paper, anywhere. Anytime, I will share the story, anytime you walk into a house and you see that binder where that type A OCD seller has every paint chip, every, you know, every maintenance record, every receipt, every everything, that is priceless because it doesn't happen that often. It's truly amazing how many people live in houses and they don't have the foggiest idea how old the roof is. They can't tell you what kind of heat they have. They just know it comes on sometimes and goes back off. And we do need a little bit more emphasis on how a little bit of just not even meticulous record keeping, just some record keeping can be the, the X factor that helps somebody move forward. Yeah. And you know what? You just gave me an idea for my next client lunch and learn. <laughs> well, Shazam, I, I'm probably going to do it too. So we'll have generated a great idea simultaneously. It's like realtor combustion for, for good for our communities. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of that, so I distracted you because we're realtors. So tell me, in the course of conducting professional real estate, what's the crazy thing you've seen up there in your area of jazz era houses? Because I'm not going to lie, that's exactly how I would be promoting these houses as jazz era because I'm a music nerd. But anyway, what have you seen in regard to real estate that was interesting? Well, interesting just to stick on the actual physical houses. I really get excited by uh, like the other day I was showing a house, there was a laundry chute. There was still a laundry chute in operation, both kids' bedrooms. You open these cute little doors and you push your laundry down. Obviously, when you're little, you push your little brother and sister down there too and follow them. And I just love the quaintness of all the houses. I try to educate my clients on that. Our houses on the first floor all have wood trim around the doors, around the windows, around all of that. And it is chestnut. And if you don't know what chestnut is, that's a sad thing because it's now extinct. It's a type of wood you can't even get anymore. It doesn't grow. Girl, it came out of the, the woods in North Carolina. I think the last American chestnut was in North Carolina when it died. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see, see, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm showing houses and they're saying, well, we're just going to paint that all white because it'll lighten and brighten it. And I give them I give them the look of death. I said, it's your house. You can do whatever you want. But if you do that, you're going to break my heart. And then I go on to explain why. And usually if their parents are with me, I get their buy-in because they're like, no, you're not doing that. No, you can't do that. I said, you can paint the walls whatever color you want, but you can't paint that wood. So those are the things I love about our houses. They're about, you know, and the other way is the way they're built. Most colonials, Victorians and Tudors, the downstairs is the spread out area for the time. That's where you gather with your family. The kitchens are bigger. The living rooms are bigger. The formal dining rooms for actually sitting and eating together. And the upstairs, often the bedrooms are small. Why are they small? Because that's not where they lived. You know, nowadays we want these huge master suites with a big closet, with a big walk-in, you know, shower and all of that. That's not the way they lived. They focused more on their family time downstairs. And by the way, I'm very stuck on structure because I have an undergraduate degree in architecture. Oh, you were made to be a nerd. Yeah, this is my nerd area. And once I kind of explained that to them, I said, again, you're buying the house. You want to blow walls out upstairs. You want to make bigger bedrooms. Go right ahead. But there's a reason why it was built this way. There's a reason why they're encouraging you to congregate downstairs. I mean, there's like a whole series here of how to make family life better with your hostess, Tracy Freeman, realtor in New Jersey, get out of your bedrooms, get out of your closet, come back to the parlor and talk to people. I mean, I love how you position that. Ah, it's good. Well, thank you. And it's just, I mean, to me, it's logical because that's what I studied, right? But to a lot of people, it's not. They say, well, we're going to have three kids, so we want four bedrooms, each with their own bathroom. 
I was like, well, who's going to fight over the toothpaste? What? I don't understand. <laughs> you can't know. And then everybody's going to be in their own room on their own device. And, and no, I don't like that. So we don't have TVs on our second floor in my house. We, unfortunately, they brought their phones and their iPads up there. But we really encourage everybody to be on top of each other. And, you know, I try to pass that along to my clients to say, do you really not want to see your children once you move out here? See, maybe you could save society because we maybe <laughs> never have discussed the fact that all of us learned how to get along as Gen Xers. And nobody talks about us because there's not many of us. But we had to share a room with your sibling. And it led to yep. knockdown drag outs, but you learned how to resolve conflict. And our children don't yes. have to do that now because they have separate rooms. Interesting, Tracy Freeman. Interesting, right here, we have a whole, a whole way to fix society, make children stay in the same room. All right. Okay. I love it. I love it. Okay, so you said you're currently working with some buyers. What's been their surprise at coming to Maplewood besides the fact that everything's as is and jazz era and they're going to have to make the children come out of their rooms? They're city people. They all want to be able to walk to town, walk to the train. Oh. I live a mile from the train station, one mile, and that is too far for most of them coming out here. I'm like, but you walk more than that in New York City in the morning. Forget about in the afternoon and in the evening. You walk miles every day, but you don't want to be a mile from the train. So I have to explain that, in, and it's Maplewood and South Orange, I should say, are our two main communities that come together. The closer you live to town, the more money it's going to cost because everybody wants to walk here. Everybody wants to leave their car behind. And I applaud that, but it, it comes at a price. So I have to educate them. Well, okay, you are a very strong buyer. You're $850,000. That's a lot of money, but you're not going to necessarily get all the bedrooms, all the bathrooms, the finished house, everything you want rolling out of bed to the train station. You may have to go half a mile to a mile away. And that's a big learning because they're not ready to be a two car family. They're not ready to have a minivan. They're not ready to embrace suburban life, but they want it all at their price. Well, if they listen to this episode, they'll realize that if their children will just share rooms, they could be closer to the train <laughs> station. And then we solved all the problems. Shazam, Tracy, their family's happier. They're closer to the train station and they can just give up a bedroom. No big deal. And they all want the big backyard. And our biggest properties are maybe half an acre, maybe, but they all want a huge backyard so their kids can play. And I have to, again, educate them and say, you have babies now. And yes, you want to keep them close to you. And, and I appreciate that. I, my girls are 11 and 13. I've gone through all those ages up until now. But when they grow up here, they're going to walk to and from elementary school by themselves. They're going to walk to middle school by themselves. Well, I shouldn't say that. Once you hit third grade, you can walk to and from school by yourself. The teachers will let you go. And that's that's a huge uh, city. People are like, what do you mean? They can't go outside. You have one client who's moving from Harlem. She said, my kids don't go outside on their own and play. And I said, but here they will. And again, it comes back to that Gen X way of living. They're going out and they're gone. I went out and I was gone from the time I got home from school until I knew it was time for dinner. And I didn't have a cell phone. Man, we weren't supposed to come home. If you came home before dark, you were in trouble. I mean, it was like, get out. We're locking the door. Don't come back for a long time. <laughs> exactly. And to the point about the property size, I'm like, you don't need to worry about more than half an acre. A, you don't want to mow it. Right. And B, your kids are not going to stay in your backyard. They're going to be running up and down the backyards of everybody's house. A beautiful thing about our towns is it was designed in the 20s before the Depression hit. Every house is walkable to a school to a playground, to a park, and to a jitney stop so that if they do live farther away from town, they can get a jitney bus and it'll take them right to the train station. Okay, well, now I want to move to Maplewood. Everybody should want to live here. Everybody. So tell me something here. You've, at, at a decade in the real estate business, you are not somebody who has been insular and only wanting to do a few houses here and there in your market. You've been visible and out there getting educated at different conferences and conventions and you're now getting super dialed in to the advocacy work that realtors do what would you say to a realtor out there who is your twin in the business 10 years in and all they've ever done is stick signs in yards and run buyers around they've never stepped one ounce of themselves outside of the production piece of real estate what would you tell them to check into and what would you tell buyers and sellers about finding realtors who are more well-rounded in their approach to real estate? Well, it's twofold. First of all, I truly appreciate the agents who just put their head down and just do work. 
and they just go and they focus on their clients and they care about them and they are heroes for those, those buyers and sellers. They make sure their needs are first and they just work the business. A lot of times they just don't know there's a lot more out there. And I mean, I ended up at my first NAR conference by happenstance. I decided to go two days before because some friends were going down to DC. So we all hopped a train and we went and my eyes were, I, I was like deer in headlights the entire time. I had no idea there were 1.3 million realtors. I had no clue. I had no idea how much advocacy is done on our behalf in DC. I didn't realize what a big seat at the table we had. I didn't know what RPAC was. I just didn't know because I was focusing on my local business, which is what a realtor should do. Look, you know, always focus on your local community and on your business. But once you have some, a really good handle of what that is, then you can go out and spread the word and understand why we need flood insurance, why, why we need to, you know, knock down bills that could take money out of our pockets. I mean, for better or worse, because our commissions are high percentages per deal, everyone thinks we have a lot of money. And I've had lots of people say, oh, well, that's just $25. It won't matter to you. Or, you know, I've, I've even had, unfortunately, tech vendors say to me, when I say, well, why did you choose real estate? This is an amazing product. It can go to anyone. Why the realtors? Well, you guys make too much money and we want to get a piece of that. And if we're not aware of how the other side of the world sees us and if we're not protective of our hard earned money, people are going to try and take it away. Amen. All right. See? Okay, people. I know y'all are in love with Maplewood too, and you're dying to get to know Tracy and you're interested in finding out how she could help your buyers and sellers in the greater Manhattan area, specifically Maplewood, New Jersey, or you may be interested in finding out how she can come lead a class for your brokerage or association. Tracy, how can they find you? You can find me all over social media as Tracy Freeman Realtor. You can find me at tracyfreemanrealtor.com. And you can also do what us Gen Xers do, and you can pick up the phone and call me. <gasps> what? At, yeah, I, it's crazy. 917-604-5735. Okay, and because we do know you people don't like to write anything down, because you would, but you don't have any writing implements nearby and you're on your device, it's cool. Because all of Tracy's information is in the show notes for this episode, so you can reach out to her for any of your real estate related questions or needs and she'll be delighted to help you. Tracy, thank you so much for coming on the show and actually showcasing what it's like to describe a community that you're in love with and are lucky enough to sell. Thank you very much, Lee. And if y'all are listening and you're like, "Uh uh-uh, my area is better than Maplewood, I have got something cooler, then hit me up at Lee Brown on Twitter to be featured in a future episode of the podcast. Subscribe for more because frankly, you just never know what you're gonna hear on here and we'll see you next time. If you are listening to this episode and you need to tell us something about your crazy life in or around real estate, then tweet me at Lee Brown or reach me on any of the social networks. That's if you're a broker, realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular normal human being who happens to have dealt in real estate. Subscribe for more episodes. And as always, we are thrilled that you joined us for some crazy shit in real estate. See you next time.